Diesel electric locomotives have been the primary power on trains in the United States for nearly a century now. Yet many of them have a feature that's not really known about, or at least understood, outside of some really nerdy circles. Transition. From an electrical engineer's perspective, this is going to seem really straightforward and kind of unsurprising, but from a locomotive engineer's perspective, this is something that's heard about but not really understood. So today we're going to explain that. What's up guys, this is Heiss, and welcome to Electrical Engineering 101! Recall that a diesel electric locomotive utilizes a big diesel engine to spin a big generator or a big alternator, and that supplies an electrical current that then runs to our traction motors, and that's what ends up letting us pull our train. It's very simple in concept, but locomotive designers early on ended up having a lot of issues keeping the voltage and the current for both the traction motors and the generator or alternator, whichever it is, in a good working range throughout the operating speeds of the locomotive. To understand, let's get into some basic electrical engineering. Ohm's law. And we're talking about resistance, not uh, zen in this application. Ohm's law tells us that for any circuit, the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. So for a given circuit with a fixed resistance, you get more voltage, get more amperage. And amperage is what makes our locomotive pull. So more amps means we pull harder. You pull the throttle to notch eight, you spin the giant electrical spinny guy and make lots of voltage. That's great. Wabam. We've got places to be, right? However, the realities of using DC motors complicate this quite a bit. For one, too much current through the motor causes all manner of melty sadness, which we don't like. And the faster we try and spin that motor, the more it tends to fight back. Motors produce what's known as back EMF, or back electromotive forces. It's essentially a voltage that fights back against the supply voltage and overall decreases the whole situation you're getting. The faster a motor spins, the higher the amount of back EMF, which means that we need to continue to supply more and more voltage to the motor. And so at a certain point, we can't give any more and the motors overcome that and we're no longer able to keep our motor in a motoring kind of position. We can't physically push it any further. So we've got problems at the high end and the low end in terms of operational speed. At the low end, we can supply way too much current and blow up the traction motor, overheat things, cause all the arcing, all that fun. And at the high end, we run into too many back EMF forces, we can't give enough voltage to the motor to continue supplying power. Enter transition as the special circuit solution to help us deal with these two different problems. Now, EMD, or the Electromotive Division of General Motors, being kind of the one that primarily led diesel locomotive manufacture in the US for a large history of all of that, also standing for every model different, there's about a million different ways that you could skin this proverbial cat. But I'm gonna go through the general way that this concept works, and then you could do a deep dive on your own favorite locomotive later, should you so desire. Generally, how a lot of early diesel locomotives were designed was that they would start with all the traction motors in series. So you'd start at your generator, You'd run to the first traction motor, then the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, in the case of a six axle unit, and then you would close the circuit back to the generator. When you set things up in this way, it means that each traction motor eats the same amount of voltage as the other. So if you're in run eight and you're supplying 600 volts, you got six traction motors, each traction motor is getting 100 of those volts. This means that we're not gonna be dumping too much current through the motors, especially close to stall because it's receiving a small proportion of the voltage supplied by the generator. As we speed up and we start to lose power because we're not giving enough voltage to deal with the back EMF, we can then swap to series parallel and you have one truck and one truck. So you've got one circuit with three traction motors back to the alternator and one circuit with the other three. So now each truck is seeing 600 volts, meaning you're getting a lot more voltage per traction motor because you've effectively split things out so everything's halved. So you're getting double the voltage at each motor in that setup. 
and as we speed up even more, we can then do the same concept, but going to individual circuits with each traction motor. So everyone is getting the full voltage of what our alternator's putting out, 600 volts apiece, which with early motors would have fried them instantaneously at stall, but at higher speeds with the back EMF competing with our voltage, now we're able to apply more power at higher speed. And again, this probably seems like first grade for any electronic engineers or electricians out there. It's very simple, very simple circuitry. But on the locomotive side of things, it's not typically something that's understood other than how you operationally deal with a locomotive that is equipped with transitioning circuits. I knew the concept myself, but I didn't really understand why it was a thing until I developed the diesel locomotive simulation for Century of Steam steam diesel eh, whatever once i did that and was going through the math of okay how many volts how many amps what's going on oh it all clicks and it becomes really easy to understand how this simple circuit solution can make the locomotive a lot more effective across a broader range of speeds and note that this doesn't mean that the locomotive can physically pull more it means that it can do so at a wider range of speeds now, operationally, a lot of early diesel locomotives had manual transition where they had a physical lever to pick which setup you were in in the cab, and the engineer had to manually roll things off, change selections, go back into the power. Most of the more modern locomotives, and by modern, I mean most everything from the 60s onward, have automatic transition where the circuitry handles everything for the engineer, and you, you might watch the amps die back and then come back on the amp meter, or maybe not, depending on how modern the locomotive is, but it's all typically handled automatically. But note that not every diesel electric locomotive out there has this, particularly not in the series, series parallel, then parallel setup that I described to illustrate the point of the system. That was something that was done in the early days, and a lot of locomotives went to different setups where they didn't even need full series applications. Locomotives that have AC traction motors instead of DC traction motors don't need to utilize this schema at all because the entire power supply on AC sides of things is entirely different and that deserves its own video someday when I understand it. <laughs> Details. A lot of the more modern, robust locomotives that had a big alternator put in and more modern traction motors didn't actually need to do anything. They could just run in full parallel and it wasn't gonna break anything. This is actually a big part in why EMD moved to using alternators rather than generators. To build a generator big enough to supply enough voltage for everything, you're talking about something that wouldn't fit in a locomotive, whereas an alternator could do the same in a smaller space. And so when you get a lot of the more modern alternator powered locomotives, a lot fewer of them have transition because the alternator was powerful enough to supply all the demand of all the traction motors and the traction motor design changed too. Again, EMD meaning every model different, as we say in the industry, uh, it varies quite a bit depending on which locomotive it is. So I definitely encourage you to go Googling around for your favorite EMD. What did it do? It, did it have transition? Did it not? And how did it achieve it if it did? Because there's a lot more beyond this basic concept. There were some locomotives that had transition within the generator with multiple different fields and all that sort of thing. And then there were some locomotives that could even vary the resistance of the motors themselves in order to precisely control the current. Uh, look up the GP35. It apparently had 16 different setups for this. It's just like, what were you thinking, EMD? Okay, they were throwing electrical engineering at the wall and seeing what sticked. It's definitely really interesting. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's one of those things that's kind of a lesser known about topic in terms of locomotive. Might seem very obvious to any electrical engineers out there, of course. But again, to locomotive engineers, it's not something that we really think about. Yeah, okay, the locomotive goes in transition, but what does that mean? And uh, <laughs> shout out to the world famous Jeff Taylor. He's the reason I'm doing this video. When I learned all this and I went through and did the math for the simulation back, you know, earlier this year, I was like, oh wow, that's cool. That's 
Yet another thing to add to the list of what have I learned about locomotives by trying to develop a simulation. Uh, and then, it, you know, that slipped the brand and whatever. And we're operating a, a visiting diesel locomotive to the museum for Dale Thomas, the uh, Georgetown Loops 130. And it had some details about transition written on the control panel. And Jeff was just like, oh, yeah, I don't know what that means. It's like, but you're, you're the world famous Jeff Taylor. He's way smarter about locomotive everything than me. I was like, that's like basic diesel stuff and he doesn't oh i guess he did okay well he's a steam guy he's not been there done that at a diesel shop so it uh put it firmly in my head to do it and hopefully you learned something and hope you thought this was neat it's a simple concept but proven really effective throughout the history of railroading anyways as always folks thanks so much for watching and we will catch you all next time good evening my name is leighton burgundy and i'm here with hyce news here to describe the beautiful migration of the incoming high spurts, bringing your summer 2025 heisttrains.com store merchandise. You can see them slowly coming in. And in the distance here, ready to make their landing in this beautiful field. Moderately paced, coming in. Maybe they're not going to land. They're not going to land. Buy the new summer 2025 HighStrains.com merch now. Get the new ES&D and ES&DT hopper cars in HO scale at heisttrains.com now. Leighton Moreland was murdered viciously by birds for these. Don't let his sacrifice be in vain.